so I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation, um, Thundrup and Tipton Norberling. Um, it's been a while since I've uh, taught at the center. Definitely, it's been a while since in person, <laughs> but it's also been a little while since a Zoom talk. Um, so it looks like the, the schedule today is going to be, uh, we have the next two hours um, for some practice. Um, I'll give some, some Dharma talks and just some discussion together. And, and since we're a really, really small group, um, it kind of puts the burden on each of us to say something, <laughs> if that's okay with you. You really don't want to, I understand. But, um, you know, some of, some of you are, I'm guessing, veterans of practice. Um, some of you, I'm not sure of your backgrounds. Um, but nonetheless, hopefully we can all sort of explore um, the Dharma deeper today and, express, and especially explore how to work with um, attachment, you know, which is probably, I would say is, I don't know. I, I, it might be a little controversial to say this, but I would say it's like, it's pretty much like 90% what, what Dharma is aiming at. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a, a, a series. I'm about to finish a, a 10 week series at um, um, uh, Tupton Kungaling in, um, in Florida on the Vajra Cutter Sutra. And the Vajra Cutter Sutra pretty much is, is uh, mostly aimed at cutting through clinging. And, you know, we could use the word clinging as uh, a synonym for attachment. I, I actually sometimes prefer to use the word clinging. It has a broader context. Um, so kind of with that as an example, we can really see that, um, you know, working with attachment initially is really the main thing binding us uh, to samsara. And so we'll... Um, We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, anyways, uh, maybe what we can do now is um, we can just start uh, re with Refuge and Bodhicitta, and then we'll do a little practice and see if there's any others who are going to join us. So feel free, Lou. Okay. So just taking a moment just to settle. Hmm settle the mind and kind of remember what we're about to do. So refuge in bodhicitta becomes an actual practice as opposed to just sort of like a rope thing we're saying. I know for me over the last 22 years, you know, if I don't take this moment, it can easily become just sort of like, oh, blah, 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 and then that's it, you know? So just take the moment to just first just rest in the body, feel your feet, feel your hands, Bring awareness into your experience within the body. If you want to include the breath in that, that's fine. Just connecting to the breath for a few moments. And then we can do a short reflection since we're a small group here today. Just recollecting the three jewels. So there's an entire sutra on this. But just for you, you know, remembering the power of the three jewels, why you're, why you're here, you know, why you got interested in Buddhism in the first place and what you've learned in your process of engaging with the Buddhist path. Here we have the Buddha as the the teacher of the Dharma as the medicine that dispels our suffering and the Sangha, the ultimate Sangha of Arhats and Bodhisattvas who become our spiritual companions, guides along the path. So just recollecting their qualities, what, what makes them on an outer level something to take refuge in. And then on an inner level, we have our own Buddha nature, our own innate awakened nature beyond permanence and, and impermanence. So we have the 
awakened nature reflected in the Buddha and the Dharma that leads to Buddhahood and in the Sangha who are have liberated themselves from samsara and are working towards the full awakening capacity of their minds. And we have that reflected in the outer sphere. And that's only possible because it can be reflected from the inner sphere of the Buddha nature we can experience, we can uncover through the path. So this is a little different than taking refuge in ourself, right? More taking refuge in the essence of mind. And briefly remembering also all sentient beings. So bringing in this bodhicitta reflection now. All sentient beings also wish for happiness, just like we do. They also wish to be free from suffering, just like we do. There's no difference in that. Yet there is a difference in how we seek it. And so reflecting on our path, on our wish for awakening, noticing that all sentient beings want happiness. And from a Buddhist perspective, that can ultimately be found within awakening from dualistic clinging, from attachment, <laughs> what we're going to talk about today, from samsara as a whole. So thinking of our plight, our predicament in our life, making it as real as possible for yourself, your, your own personal sufferings, the ups and downs of each day, you know, even just being here and maybe we're a little sleepy or maybe there's some, something else on our mind or whatever kind of even minute form of dissatisfaction or suffering. This is a cause for compassion for ourselves. This is also a cause for compassion for others that they experience maybe not the exact same thing, but very similar forms of anxiety, stress, dissatisfaction, and of course, birth, old age, sickness, death, rebirth. So you can take it as far as you want into the Buddhist principles, or you can just keep it local, you know, just to problems you can bear witness to with your own eyes and ears. And we generate compassion, a sense of aspiration or a wish that ourselves and all sentient beings can be free from suffering and its causes. This is based on love, wishing that ourselves and others can have happiness in its causes. And we move this further into the mind of aspirational bodhicitta, just generating the mind. I wish to attain awakening for the benefit of others. I wish to engage in this teaching today and any practice today for this purpose. So that it can open my path more to awakening for the benefit of all, that we become the refuge that then can serve others in more skillful ways towards their awakening. It's okay if this is generated as a thought, but if you can bring it into a feeling level, that's great too. If not, that's okay. You can just leave it as an aspirational thought for now. So with that, we'll, we'll engage the chants and hopefully now we have some more juice. And so as we're reciting the words, we're reflecting a little bit further on what we just generated, what we just reflected on, did a short meditation on. So we'll recite once in Tibetan, uh, once in English, and then again, a third time in Tibetan. Sange Chodon Sogi Chonama Chanchu Bardu Dadi Kamsu Chi Dagi Chunyan Gipe Sanan Gi Trola Pinchir Sange Drupar I go for refuge until I'm enlightened. 
the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye Chedong Soygi Chonama Chancho Bardo Dani Kamsa Chi Pagi Chinyangi Pesanami Trola Penchir Sangye Lutarshong Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs> hey, Lana, I like your background there. <laughs> Are you in the Bay Area? Or no? no, I'm actually in LA. <laughs> You're in LA. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so just to, just to kick it off, I thought we could have a short chat together um, about... I wrote it down. <laughs> Um, what, what, what comes to mind, uh, when you hear the word attachment or when you reflect on attachment and, you know, the purpose of these kind of questions and discussions together is to make it personal. Like it doesn't have to be a, a Buddhist book answer. Like maybe some of us have studied Buddhism for a while and we know the kind of Buddhist book answer. We're going to talk a lot about that, but just kind of what, what, what's your experience of it? What, what comes to mind on a personal level? Um, and you know, feel free to unmute yourself or if you want to put it in the chat, if it's easier to write it, that's also fine. Well, to me, I think the attachment is that need to get somewhere, need to achieve something. And, and, and we think that by achieving them, we're going to be happy. Uh, right. But what we learn experientially, the moment you get there, you, the moment you achieve it, something else comes to mind so it's never it's you can never be satisfied because and i i notice you go in a perpetual cycle of wanting one thing after another after another after another and you end yeah. up on well you know you, you you're kind of running and and you never get anywhere cool so 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 you feel like that like like some of the time that's your experience yeah. De definitely it's very experiential and by studying buddhism on my own and reading a lot of books i i realized it experientially i notice it not only about myself but obviously about others because we all made we all made the same way right so yeah. uh, so that's kind of what what i think about the attachment that's immediately what comes to mind the wanting things and usually those things like out there in the world, in future, it's, it's, you know, you're projecting out. So you're putting your happiness always out in front of you and trying to run after it. And you just keep pushing it out and out and out because once you get to a certain point, you just keep pushing it out. You know, you can keep coming up with new things to want New, th new things that you think is going to make you happy and and you just keep running through life <laughs> good awesome thank you i know that one of my problems is that i've been noticing recently and i never gave it a thought before is that i am totally attached to what people think about me if I'm in a conversation or if I'm talking with somebody online through Facebook, I'll say something so they'll like me. It may not be what I believe. It may not be what I want to say, but that's what I'll say because them liking me is way much more important to me than whatever I have to you know, say. And I've been trying to wean myself away from that. And I am getting some distance now between what I say and I think about it before I say it. And so I've, I've cut down on it a lot, but it is very, very deep. We yeah. thought it was a good person. Yeah, good one. I can relate to, I can relate to both what, what, what you said and Lana said, for sure. Thank you. I always think of it as like, like a stickiness 
um, like kind of like honey or tar or like that's kind of what comes up for me. It's like there's no space. It's just the object. It's just it's like being glued to something. Um, like you don't have when it when it's arising then that energy is arising. You just don't have um, like Lou was saying. He's gaining separation, which I think is the process of untangling attachment. But when it's quite strong, then it's only it's like there's just the object in the mind, and there's no space between oneself and the object. Um, it's like just an overwhelming attraction or stickiness to the object. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Totally, totally. <laughs> I can I can relate to that too. <laughs> um, you know, I've had. I'll just share something briefly. But obviously, I'm going to be sharing a lot today, so I'm um, I'm not going to say too much at right this moment. But um, the, you know, for me, this is kind of like I have I have a lot of questions around this, right? In, in the sense of like I have you know what 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 Buddhism informs in my life, and then of course through practice and and continued study and and reflection that 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 information grows, right? But I, I kind of have this question that I ask myself sometimes, like like every month or every couple of weeks, did I do anything in the last month that wasn't based in attachment aversion? <laughs> you know, this is like a question I started asking myself a few years ago. And, uh, you know, this is a question I'll just leave open for us to explore today. Um, because this kind of gets a little bit more to what I want to discuss, which is this entanglement. You know, I, I like this word entanglement. Um, the entanglement we have with samsaric mind, you know, because when we're talking about attachment in a, in a Buddhist context, we also have to talk about the fuller picture of how we get what is entanglement with samsaric mind. And, and I, I use the word mind on purpose because samsaric also, samsara is also a, there is a body experience, right? There is a, you know, a physical experience to samsara, but primarily from a Mahayana perspective, it happens in the mind from a Mahayana Buddhist perspective, right? Or we could say sort of like, I think something, Somehow this is a very controversial statement these days, but that mind produces body, you know, from, from a scientific perspective, that sounds ridiculous. From a Buddhist perspective, we, we track and, and have an understanding of how that happens. So we can talk about that too. But yeah, on a personal level, I like to really ask this question of like, you know, is there anything that, that I'm doing that's not out of aversion or attachment? And like I said, I usually can't find much that's not. I mean, sometimes the aversion or attachment can be less, or there can be some neutrality, right? Uh, neutrality is another state we, we can experience. Um, so sometimes maybe there's neutrality or some like maybe percentage of the time from Dharma practice, there's, there's some other states being experienced. Um, but for me, it's very sticky, like, like what Dundrup said, you know, it's that stickiness that, and, and I'm in it, you know, there's this sense of like, you know, I, I had this analogy come to my mind, like if, we, if you jump in a mud pit, and you're just fully immersed in a mud pit and someone comes says, Hey, you're in a mud pit, but you don't know when you're in a mud pit. You're just like, no, I'm not, you know, or, or really, you know, like there can be a lot of different responses until we start to get our body out of the mud pit and we see, Oh yeah. And we have some kind of a little bit of objective experience of like, Oh yeah, I'm covered in mud. <laughs> and I feel like attachment is very, like very much like this where, you know, I can get sucked into experience, whether it's, you know, I love my kind of strong coffee in the morning. So there's, you know, let's take that object because it's a pretty uh, neutral object. Uh, so, you know, I get immersed in it. You know, it's this kind of like sticky, this, there's this build, there's this expectation. And then there's kind of like, oh, this is going to be, you know, and it's, a lot of it's unconscious. A lot of it's just, oh, this is going to be delicious. You know, blah, blah, blah. My, I'm thinking, feeling, and then I'm making it and smelling it and then drinking it. And, you know, definitely for me, the experience is never as fulfilling as the buildup, you know, to what it's going to be, that's for sure. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, you know, I, I, it, there's this experience for me of like immersion, you know, so we could, I could use that word entanglement again, but sort of, you know, I, Lou, you were saying this sense of like, you know, I, I share that with you, you know, where, where, um, it actually took me a long time to, I've been teaching Dharma for and meditation for probably about 12 or 13 years. It took me a long time to just kind of get over, you know, do people need to like me? 
like in, in, in the meditation class, you know, or when I'm teaching Dharma and pretty much, you know, in, in kind of like Dharma teaching 101 qualities of a teacher, you should not be attached, you know, you should not follow a teacher who's attached to like the need to be liked. Like, you know, we could just add that in as a modern thing. So as a, you know, for me, that was a big struggle for a long time um, until I started to shift some of how I thought of that and started to, you know, work differently and just kind of go through that passage. But, but definitely in other aspects of my life, there's, there's that kind of immersion into that mind sometimes of like, especially with people close to me, like if they get upset with me, you know, how do I fix this? You know, how do I, how do I remedy this instead of, you know, uh, um, how do I connect? Right. Like, so, so we can start to talk about some of the remedies that some of the remedies I'm going to, I'm going to present are traditional Buddhist remedies today. We're going to talk about, but some are not uh, because I feel we have to, we have to do this on a personal level, sometimes from an inquiry based sort of position. And I'll talk about that as a method as well. Um, um, I'm calling it like inquiry based living. A lot of how I teach is based on this uh, these days. And I, I would say that's grounded in Buddhist thought and, and, and sort of how to reflect and how to meditate and how to uh, go about inquiry and questions can sometimes come from uh, be informed from the Buddhist path. Uh, but nonetheless, sort of this, this sense of inquiry, looking into, okay, well, well, do I want to be connected? Or do I want to get what I want? Right? So in some ways, I think connection, like or centering connection can really drive a lot of how we can initially start to get disentangled from attachment, right? And of course, that comes through awareness, uh, Buddhist practice of awareness, which we'll mainly talk about today. But anyways, thank you all so much. That's, that's really helpful. And I hope um, we can just continue to talk about this today and um, just reflect on the different things that come up in our lives. Um, so I wanted to start off a little bit... Um, I mean, it sounds like a lot of you have, you know, pretty large understanding already of a Buddhist framework of attachment. But like I said, I thought it might be useful to talk about this sort of overall entanglement and sort of connecting the dots. I don't know about you, but I find it really helpful um, in the Buddhist path. Sometimes there can be so many separate topics and, and it's difficult to weave those into a, a cohesive context. And so that's what I kind of want to do today. Um, I call this kind of like foundational work, but for me in, in, in my practice and, and learning, it, it's not so much foundational work. It's sort of like the structure um, that then allows that to get filled in and iterated on over time, right? If that makes sense. Um, so some of this is going to sound familiar, and, and if, if some of it doesn't, uh, feel free to, you know, you can... We're, we're just three, four of us today. So just unmute yourself at any point. There's no, there's no, there doesn't need to be any kind of protocol around that. Just interrupt me. It's totally cool. It's fine today. Um, so what I really wanted to start off talking about was this ground of Buddha nature. And um, this is kind of, um, it's a particular teaching we find, you know, the, pri the primary text we study in Mahayana or, or indigenous Tibetan Buddhism is the Uttara Tantra, the Gyu Lama, um, when it relates to Buddha nature. And the Gyu Lama is kind of what, one of these texts that's actually quite, it's very difficult. It's a very challenging text. Usually it happens in the monastic curriculum, it depends on the monastery, but usually it happens after Madhyamaka or middle way studies. And just tell me if some of this some of these terms, some of you don't know them at all. I'm, I'm happy to define them. But the middle way studies are really the teachings on the view of, of reality, on the view of, you know, what's going on here? How, how do things exist, right? How do they not exist? Um, and these, these stemming from, you know, Nagarjuna, one of the, you know, premier uh, Indian Buddhist philosophers and yogis, uh, that, that a lot of the Tibetan scholastic uh, tradition, philo philosophic tradition formed out of. Um, so nonetheless, the Gyu Lama, this, this Buddha nature text is, is interesting because, you know, I find it interesting that it comes after middle way teachings, because sometimes we hear the word Buddha nature in a very colloquial way. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes I hear it like, 
oh yeah, we all have Buddha nature, like this kind of like kumbaya kind of <laughs> kind of expression, which isn't bad. So I'm not going to knock that, but it's not telling the whole truth, right? And um, I was recent. I was studying a, a short commentary on Buddha nature by a by a Rime Lama named Mipam Rinpoche, um, and for, for me, I, I a lot of my Tibetan Buddhist studies happen in a Rime fashion. So I was in, you know, I study uh, across Galug, Nima Kagyu. And um, this is to, you know, on a philosophical level, that's, that helps me really inform my studies. I really enjoy that. But for 10 years, it was primarily Galupa, uh, getting a basis in that. Um, but anyways, um, so, so this Mipa Rinpoche was saying, actually, um, to, to, uh, to authentically talk about understand and teach buddha nature is much more difficult than teaching emptiness teaching the nature of reality and i thought wow how is that you know and the more i thought about it i thought that's true so that's my preface for, <laughs> for that's my my uh, opening for about for you know where i want to go talking about buddha nature basically saying i'm not going to be able to talk about buddha nature fully right and i want also want to introduce this thing as this um, again, as some kind of inquirer question that maybe we can use in our practice and use for our exploration of attachment. And the reason this matters is, you know, the, the basic premise around Buddha nature is that the mind in its, in its sort of raw state, you know, just to use some more, you know, uh, uh, less jargon, um, is free, is free from samsara. It's not, it's not embedded in it. It's not of it. Because if, it, if it's of it, then there would be no way to get out of it. You know, we would be in a, always a subject object experience or, you know, it would also be impermanent. Um, so there's a lot of logical reasonings for it. But so, so without getting too much into like, well, what is Buddha nature? We could just say that it's, it's our mind in its free and open state, right? Dundra mentioned, I think you mentioned spaciousness, right? Around like the opposite of attachment. So, you know, some of these terms sometimes get so lofty, but actually sometimes they're referring to states or like pieces of states that we already experience. Like each of us through meditation, I'm sure has experienced some level of spaciousness. And that brought it not only brought us in, but it inspired us to continue, right? I mean, for me, it's very much like that. Just even spaciousness of like, oh, my thoughts aren't just bombarding me all the time you know that's some kind of spaciousness so anyways um in one way we could talk about buddha nature as spaciousness it's it's absolute level connected to a now i'm going to use some jargon a non-dualistic spaciousness or a lack of subject object spaciousness and this is really talking the root of mind not thoughts or awareness even it's talking something a little bit deeper and then that buddha nature has a quality of luminosity that buddha nature has a quality that can perceive, right? That can experience, that can know. And that's really powerful because space in and of itself, it doesn't have much power. It doesn't have much um, efficacy or agency. But when there's luminosity inseparable with space, or we could say uh, uh, knowing inseparable with space, that's when the potential of freedom happens. You know, there's... There's mind that's experiencing space and living that space. And in a way, we could call that freedom. Now, this space I'm talking about is a deeper space, the, the space of, of shunyata or, or the realization, of, uh, the full realization of emptiness. And we'll come back to that later because um, this isn't a class on emptiness. But I did realize I need to talk about it today to really talk about the full scope of attachment in Buddhism. So, so this ground of Buddha nature is incredibly good news right? It is, the, it is the news that we are not a screwed up person. <laughs> you know, we, I, I like that. Um, you know, it's the news that we are not fundamentally messed up. I like to just say it really simply like that. And then, of course, we can take it further in texts like the Gulama into what it actually is describing. Um, and we could say when it relates to attachment, the reason we can be free of attachment is because it's not part of that Buddha nature, fundamentally, right? It's something extraneous. It's something on the surface. It's something, um, a misperception, an illusion happening on top of that, right? 
So I think this is really interesting news. I, I was, I know the Dalai Lama, His Holiness Dalai Lama was, I, th- I think they made a new Lam Rim, uh, him and Tupton Chodron. I don't know if any of you know more about it. I checked it on Amazon a little bit, but I was curious if they were, if they put Buddha nature in there because uh, the, the, one of the reasons for it was His Holiness Dalai Lama thought that um, there was a necessity that Westerners, um, that it, there was a, a way Westerners could relate to the Lam Rim or the graduated stages of the path material in a different order. So his thought was to change the order a little bit, uh, put meaning like in the traditional Lam Rim, uh, guru yoga, guru devotion would start first. And his idea was maybe that should come later. I remember that part as part of the conversation. And, you know, whether we agree or disagree with that, um, I, I, I really, my vote is that Buddha nature comes first because when we, when we have some understanding and then of course experience of this, it really changes the way we relate to attachment, aversion, ignorance, all these aspects of the path. Because, um, you know, I wanted to ask this question later, but I'll just put it out there and then we'll see if, if we can discuss it later. You know, how many times when we are stuck in our attachment, are we personalizing that as uh, myself, yourself, being a good or bad person based on that, right? This is a big one. This is a big one. Because when we're disentangling, you know, how to work with attachment from a Buddhist perspective versus other perspectives, this is really key. Because from the Buddhist perspective, there's not, a, in my view, in, in, in my experience and understanding, there's no qualification of like, oh, you're really attached to this, so you're a really crappy person. Like, there's, there's nothing in the teaching that says that, you know? It does talk about conduct, and it does talk about conduct producing suffering or producing happiness or, you know, moving closer to awakening, um, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when we translate it into our Western view, and our, our habits and patterns and hidden belief systems and all those kinds of things. I think this question often comes up with the students I work with. This is really one of the main things I see, as well as in me, you know, this idea that I am fundamentally a screwed up person, but we're not thinking that it just comes out in our behavior and thoughts. So I, I want you to give that some thought. Um, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, it's kind of of a raw one. That's why I don't want to bring it up in the beginning. (laughs) Like, I don't, you know, just reflect on that. If that's something you experience, Uh, it's a little deeper, but nonetheless, this teaching on Buddha nature on its superficial level, uh, like I was saying is incredibly inspiring because it's the first glimmer. Some of us, I mean, I don't know about you, for me, it was the first glimmer of hope that I heard that maybe I'm not innately inherently a screwed up person you know, right? That, yes, I can get attached. Yes, I can have a version and act uh, uh, um, badly or, or act, you know, in unskillful ways towards others. But that doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It just means I'm caught up in confusion, right? So that brings me to the next point I wanted to make, just setting up this, this scaffolding for us. And again, um, hopefully this is kind of filling in with you all's to study and practice already and just maybe you're hearing it from a different perspective or maybe it's not that different but see what you can come up with because i kind of very much view this today as like i'm not here to give you information or to be the boss in front of the room like like let's pull stuff out together so i'll invite you into conversation in a few few moments around this um so what i'm interested in is like how are you relating to this how do you relate to this scaffolding just reflect on that for a moment um so, so this ground of Buddha nature um, is important because it's a recognition that there is a an un um, an unsoiled experience, an unsoiled nature there, right? That's all. Like on a, on a superficial level, there's something that's unsoiled. I love this analogy uh, that you know between the window and dirt that can get caked on the window. So attachment would be like the dirt on a window, right? And when we, when we say, when we see a dirty window in our house and it gets dirty enough, you know, if we, if we care at all about, you know, cleanliness, we often say, well, I need to clean that window or I'm going to go clean that window or whatever. But are we actually cleaning the window or are we just removing the dirt? Was the window ever dirty? 
right? And we're just talking relative phenomena here. No, right? The window was never actually dirty because if the window was actually fundamentally dirty, there'd be no way to clean it because the dirt would be inseparable with the window, right? So these are just some, some light logic, you know, some light analytical reflection talking about Buddha nature. So Buddha nature is very similar where the dirt of our, you know, obscurations, traumas, uh, kar um, karmic obscurations, um, thought patterns, attachment, aversion, all this stuff, um, identity trips, all of this is just simply something extraneous, you know, on, you know, you could say covering the window of our Buddha nature. Sometimes they use the analogy of a mirror uh, for Buddha nature. Uh, but nonetheless, something that's limpid and clear, you know, water could be another uh, metaphor. Um, but something is covering that, and that something that's covering it is not it. And this is really, really key to start to bring into our, our thinking here. Because typically the, the Shravakiana path, or we could say the lower medium scopes of Lam Rim in the... In the uh, and Lam Rim is not just a Galuk thing, it's across all the lineages, but let's just say like Galuk Lam Rim, like Lama Tsongkhapa's main presentation, Lam Rim Shenmo. Um, we really see, you know, in the, in the lower medium scopes, it, it really starts off with the suck, you know, because that's really the Four Noble Truths, you know, there is suffering. First, we got to acknowledge that and we have to see that on a deep level to then want to get out of it, right? And so... Um, there's not this perspective of Buddha nature that comes later in the Mayana teachings, but nonetheless, I think it's important when we frame it from a Mayana perspective, Buddha nature first, and then we can start to talk about the confusion, samsaric experience, karmic obscurations, and you know what we call the three poisons, right? Attachment, aversion, and uh, uh, ignorance or, or misperception. Um, those being laid on top uh, of that Buddha nature as something not of it, right? So, so that's the entanglement. How we get entangled from this perspective is we've lost our compass. You know, the compass got lost outside of itself, started looking for itself and all around the room, you know, <laughs> right? This is like a, like a very simple way to put it, but if it's confusing, let me know. Um, so that compass sort of, it's not that the compass is wrong. It's just that the compass started looking this way, Right. And when the compass started looking this way, it lost touch with its Buddha nature. But nonetheless, it just doesn't realize everything that it's perceiving is the Buddha nature. But nonetheless, that's kind of, that's for another, that's for another workshop. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, um, what, what is the result of that? What's the result of getting entangled with the dirt rather than the window is that um, we experience more dirt. You know, we get entangled with misperception, uh, ignorance, clinging or attachment and aversion. And then those three poisons, as you probably all know, uh, produce karmic obscurations and karmic obscurations or karmic seeds then result in suffering or happiness. And this whole samsaric experience that from, you know, I'm not sure uh, uh, all your levels of sort of like... Um, drinking the Buddhist Kool-Aid, as I put it. <laughs> um, and I mean that affectionately, right? Um, but, you know, for me, this idea of six realms, like which I would call, you know, most of those six realms are embodied experiences. Some of them are not, right? But the six realms are the result. Like the six realms are the, the result of action based, taken, you know, action taken through ignorance, attachment, or aversion or any other sort of delusion. And so, um, you know, in one way, to, to people new to Buddhism, it can kind of sound wild, right? I mean, those of you who've been around Buddhism a long time, maybe you could reflect on it as a new Buddhist, or like when you were first starting out. Um, it's wild, like some of these six realms. I mean, sometimes we have wounding around how some of these six realms were taught to us in maybe another from another religious perspective. And, and so it's even difficult to hear the word hell or, you know, any of that. And this isn't really a talk on the six realms today, but not, but nonetheless, what we're really just talking about is six frameworks of perception, you know, and that perception happened so strongly with so much clinging that it formed a body, you know, 
where I have hands and can do this, you know, which is pretty wild. I mean, when we start to take this mechanism or structure back and back and back, even as a Buddhist, when I get out of the belief, right, meaning like I've, I've definitely, I, I've ascribed to that belief that there are six realms of, of birth for, you know, probably 20 years. Um, but when I get out of it, you know, not meaning I have to discard the belief, because um, obviously there's, I can see the animal realm, I can see the human realm, et cetera. Um, and I can infer other realms. Um, but when I, when I sort of look at it from the outside, I can see, wow, that's a wild thing, you know, really wild thing that just the mind of attachment causes that, right? Just perpetuating this mind of attachment and then actions of body, speech, and mind that come out of that perpetuate that. So, so again, I hope you are, are picking up on this, this kind of style I'm trying to, to you know, uh, how do you say, influence for today, which is just this opening up, opening up our mind around some of these con concepts. And so samsara, this experience of samsara, which happens in a body, which happens in a mind, which happens in perception, which happens in unique and collective experiences, both, um, this all comes, comes about through a mind that clings. You know, this all comes about through just that, like some of you described, that stickiness and that, that habit. And that habit itself is a result of it. So that's why samsara is to circle, right? I mean, really, the one of the root definitions of samsara is to, is, is to circle. And, um, you know, even if we have trouble with some of the more physical embodiments of samsara, like the belief in other realms and you know, rebirth and all that, we could still see the circling happening in the mind moment to moment. And that's really important. I think primarily that is the one to tackle as a Buddhist meditator. That is the one to work with. But my take, my, my belief, my, my sort of, you know, advice is try to bring that into this context or this structure of the Buddhist path and what's happening because it brings it to a deeper layer of suffering and the cause of suffering, right? You know, basics, just four noble truth, suffering, cause of suffering, elimination of suffering, elimination of suffering happening based on a path that gets us to recognize that, you know, how to cut through attachment, how to cut through aversion and ignorance. So, so this is really important. Um, I'll just leave it open for a second, just to see if I'm missing anything or, or you all have anything you want to throw in or, if, if, if this is resonating or landing for you. I think the another way why, why the attachment is formed is that basically the attachments to our self or attachment to the concept that there is a fixed self out there, right? That there is a body and there is this quasi, you know, quasi sense of, like this is me, right? And, and that's another way, and it's what's where the attachment is kind of getting rooted. This is like the 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 the, the very bottom layer of stickiness is there. And yes. once you kind of start to see through that, then it becomes more easy to cut through attachment because you start to see that your experiences, your your sense perceptions are changing moment to moment and there is nothing really fixed out there right you go you go to sleep and at some sense when you're in the deep sleep you cease to exist right so where does yeah. this self go yeah so I, yeah sorry so i think it's it's kind of you know the 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 core of all the the afflictions i think it starts from from within, from us having our own center to be our mental concept of ourselves. And that's yep. where everything kind of arises out of, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's really, you know, when we're taking this to its deep, deepest level, are we just trying, I mean, what you're pointing out is, is also what I wanted to point out, which is, you know, are we just trying to cut attachment here and there, like branches on a tree? Or are we trying to understand what is, you know, helping this tree to thrive that's a poisonous tree or something that's not providing freedom for us? So, yeah. And that, 
that's where within the three poisons, you know, the most important one to eventually pay attention to is misperception, right? Or, or ignorance, because right? that's that ignorance of the misperception. And, you know, the way I was describing it today was from this perspective of like Buddha nature and what's extraneous to Buddha nature, right? So, so window and dirt. So, so the ignorance is the misperception or the looking outwards at, at the dirt as experience, right? And, and by dirt, it's kind of a heavy metaphor, but um, this also means like the parts of ourself that are, that we like, unfortunately like it also means like the self that we're like yes this is me and i'm excited about this that also is part of delusion from a buddhist perspective so it's very tricky here because i think this word buddhism is very difficult to sell at a certain point <laughs> because it's like oh yeah that happiness you think is happy no nah, not so much actually <laughs> like you know but but my point is you know we have to each come to our own experience of that right and and that has to be real that has to be an experience based in uh, insight, you know, wisdom coming through through reflection and meditation. But thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's when it's based in the misperception of self, attachment and aversion flourish. Um, so with that said, what I'd like to do is maybe, well, I want to hear from, from you, you all, but what I want to also move into, maybe we'll do a little bit, bit of practice, but what I want to move into also is like how to tackle it from the branch and the root you know, because that I think is really important. You kind of, we see that throughout Buddhist uh, practice and, you know, ethics and vows and all that. We see all kinds of ways to look at and work with attachment. You know, we could either work with the branch, you know, learning how to cut off the branches or like you were saying, Lana, going down to the root of, of how the self is, how it's appearing to the self. This is the way I like to put it. Yeah. But any, and do drop uh, anything on your minds or? The only thing I have on my mind and and maybe related to something you may be talking about later is that right now I'm at the point where everything I do that I used to think is good, like every act of charity, every nice thing I say, seconds after I do it, I get the feeling that there was so much attachment attached to it that it ruins it for me. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I did this good thing and now I know that I did this good thing because it either made me feel good, I was reacting you know, to an attachment. So hopefully I'm getting to the point where I get so sick of that that I'm ready for renunciation. But right now, that's what I'm moving through. Mm. I would argue that is the renunciation developing you know, to a certain degree. Meaning, meaning you're seeing, I mean, there's two things. Are you open to some feedback on that? I don't know if you wanted any. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the first thing I would say was like, I feel you, you know. Um, and sometimes there's n nothing we can do about that. Meaning like, we can do something about that right now. You can, you're having the wish. You want something deeper, you know, more profound, more authentic, right, to you. But we're, we also have to just do it sometimes like with the fake you know what i mean with the sort of strings attached let's put it that way you know and so what i mean by that is i think these are very long-term transformations for most of us you know most of us are gradual path practitioners and so you know i was curious like if anybody was coming today um thinking attachment something we can just like learn a few tricks on and get rid of you know and I don't think any of you have that viewpoint. Uh, but if you do, let me know. Because uh, it's just, you know, even as holiness the Dalai Lama, I remember when I was a monk, I remember hearing this teaching. It actually gave me relief uh, where he said, uh, sexual desire is the last thing to go when you're, when you're having, when you're releasing attachment, you know. And for me, primarily as a monk, sexual desire was one of the biggest clutches I worked with. Not, not, not all, the only one, but it was one of the bigger yeah. ones for me. Because I was pretty young when I got ordained. And so, um, anyways, th there was relief in that. There was like, oh, if, if even the Dalai Lama is saying that takes a long time. Okay, I, I, can, I can sit and do my work, you know? So, so I really like your, your motivation. Like your, your, that's what I was saying. Like, that's the good news. I think there is renunciation there. Because you want to learn 
and you want to practice how to do it on a more skillful level, but expecting all the strings attached to disappear all of a sudden, you know, might be unrealistic, right? I mean, I don't know. You have to explore that. Um, and so much of Buddhism is this. So much of Buddhism, I feel, uh, you know, as beginner and intermediate practitioners is, um, is kind of fake it till, till we make it a little bit, you know? Like, I mean, what are vows, for instance? Like, I, I, I you know, I got to think uh, nine years as a monk, I got to think a lot about what vows are. And vows are slightly different depending on the classification, right? We have probably moksha, bodhisattva, and tantric vows. Um, but they all have a thread, which is setting up some kind of a boundary in order to see when we, you know, when we cross that boundary. So some are like, you know, pretty clear, like you cross that boundary, you're not this anymore. Like you cross some boundaries as a monk, you're not a monk anymore. It's very clear. With some other boundaries, you cross them and they're almost impossible not to cross. And then you have to purify and, you know, take the vows again and then you keep going. So the vows almost become, they become a, um, I can't think of the word right now, but, you know, they become a, a beacon, I guess, to, to work off of, right? And so I would call that very much there's kind of strings attached because if, if the vow wasn't there, meaning like, how do, you, how do you say it? Like the vow is there because we haven't experienced less attachment and less aversion or the freedom from aversion and, and attachment yet. So the vow is there because of that R rather than sort of more of, I would call a Judeo-Christian perspective of like, oh, you, you are good or bad depending on this vow. I never see Buddhist vows uh, or ethics from that, from that viewpoint, right? Although there's certain karmic repercussions, right? So I think maybe that can be applied a little bit, just reflecting on, on, on what you just, just spoke on, Lou. I don't know. What do you think? What do you just well, and I know that part of the problem is that I can understand a lot of things intellectually on the surface yeah. with my gross consciousness. But I'm um, 75, I grew up Catholic, I was an altar boy, thought of becoming a Jesuit monk. Um, there's so much built into me that is dying to turn all this thing that I can see is just a string into something more serious, like a defect or mm. original sin or, you know, intellectually, I know that's all foolishness, but getting getting it down into the subconscious and working with it there. I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Yeah. The, I'm with you, you know, and, and I think that's a huge subject you just brought up. And I just want to say for me, that is part of what we're talking about here because this is how Buddhism gets real. You know, I, I mean, I've taught a lot. I mean, you can see I like to weave in Buddhist philosophy too because it's, it's interesting to me and it provides a little bit of a perspective or context for us uh, in what we're doing. But uh, for me, if it doesn't get real, you know, if, if we don't have tools, we're going to talk about tools today, by the way. If we don't have tools to make things real for us, meaning embodied and very personal, all that other stuff, like you said, is just intellectual, you know? And so, you know, in Buddhism, we, we on the path, we go through a process of um, understanding, experience, and then what's called unchanging realization. Now, that unchanging realization stuff is related to not-self and emptiness. So it's related to non-duality. That's why it's unchanging. But the understanding and experience perspective, so much can happen there. And I think it's that understanding and experience uh, level, the bridge between those, that is really tough. So I, I just want to acknowledge that. That's tough. And... Um, and I think um, there's so much to dive into in our habit patterns from our life, like you're expressing, you know, the original sin, you know, and, and I didn't grow up Catholic. I grew up Jewish, uh, reformed, you know, very loose. And I wasn't that into it. I was more interested in smoking weed, you know, at Hebrew school with friends than like, listening to the Torah. Um, but, but anyways, um, <laughs> there, there, there's an element of original sin. I feel, in my opinion, embedded in Western culture. It's just there. So, so you had a very strong experience, of, uh, it sounds like, Lou. But I think all of us have to deal with it as a cultural consequence, consequence you know? And, um, and this is a big one. And, and um, 
you know, I'm happy. We could talk more about it today if you want. I have um, things I like to work with people on that, um, but but just for our because our thing is generally on attachment today. But I would just encourage you: there are ways to heal that. I guess is what I'm trying to say, for lack of a better word. And it's never never too late. You know, it's never too late. And I think this this I don't know if you want to be pointed in in a direction, but we're going to talk about awareness as the main sort of tool. Uh, for working with attachment. And that's going to help you a lot in this realm too, you know, um, of working with sort of original sin embedded in, in, in us. Um, but it's that awareness combined with study uh, of, you know, Buddha nature, the view of, of Shunyata, and then practice, right? And especially finding practices that help us to connect to openness. Because this is one of the 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 difficult points I see in Western Buddhism, it either stays in the head for a lot of people or they resist learning about Dharma and contextualizing it. And they just want to go to experience and practice. But the problem without the learning, the experience is hard to develop because we just go all over the place and we don't know what we're looking for. But if it's all stuck in the head, we could, we could also see how much of a problem that is. I think the first 10 years of my practice is just totally stuck in my head. And so we have to learn forms of meditation that allow the learning to drop. And sometimes this just takes time as well. Uh, but if, if we feel like there's an imbalance there, there are ways to remedy that. I just want to say that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. I think it's, it's great. You're aware of it. I mean, I always say like awareness is half the ballot, half the battle, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you're aware. And then make sure you're not harming yourself with that awareness, right? That's the, this is the last thing I say. It's kind of the double arrow. You know, a lot of people like this story these days of the Buddha uh, instructing the man who got shot by an arrow to pull, just pull the arrow out, you know, which sounds kind of dumb, but, but like, you know, the man came shot by an arrow wondering like, you know, what do I do? You know, where does this come from? Why did this happen? Who shot it? You know? Uh, where's the, what's the village the person lives in? And the Buddha's like, don't you just want to pull it out first? <laughs> like, like, you know, this is not like the first. So sometimes we call this the double arrow. And so it's like, you know, you're aware of, of uh, what, what I'm hearing you saying as, as a lack or a, um, how do you say, a gap in your behavior or experience. And, and then you fault yourself for that. <laughs> right. So, so, this is where the inquiry based living, I think would really help. It sounds like an Oprah. <laughs> I have to think of another name for this, but it's something that's like so vital to my practice. And that actually Buddha Dharma has taught me, but they, it's taught me implicitly. Cause you know, a lot of the times when I first started studying Buddha Dharma, it seemed like lists of rules and perspectives and um, ideologies and beliefs. And then I realized it's a cultural disconnect that in Asian, you know, indigenous, where this was practiced indigenously, there was much more a flavor of inquiry, much more a flavor of, and I'm sure there's rigidity and, and you know, dogmatism too, depending on the monastery or place or, or whatever. So I'm not going to blanket everything. But in general, I think there's more room for openness, inquiry, and things like that, and belief. So there's room for both. And, you know, His Holiness Dalai Lama always says, uh, belief generally in, in Buddhism should be based on, on reasoning, right? And, and for me, reasoning is not like, what do I need to think and do to prove this? Reasoning is more like, how is this? What is this? What's going on here? Hmm, that's interesting. So by inquiry, that's what I mean. Lots of open-ended questions we can ask our experience via awareness. Awareness is really the first step, yeah? Um, cool. Cool. So, you all want to practice a little bit just to break it up? <laughs> the ones you're hearing me rant the whole time. <laughs> um, I think everybody has a practice of meditation. Yes, I'm assuming. I don't, I mean, yeah, okay. So, I wanted to talk a little bit more about awareness today and how I can maybe uh, offer some, 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 
styles of practicing awareness. But nonetheless, um, I don't want to talk more right now. So let's just practice the awareness we know, right? And maybe I'll guide it a little bit. And basically, um, we can do a little bit of shamatha together. So shamatha is, is the training in undistracted, uh, clear nowness, right? So that's the view. That's one way to talk about the view of shamatha. And then shamatha can have an object or it can be objectless. I was going to talk more about objectless shamatha today or, or shamatha without support. But my guess is probably you guys have learned shamatha with an object. And that, so that's totally fine to just start with that. So the first is just kind of checking in with motivation. You're welcome to close your eyes or keep them half open or fully open. I tend to meditate more and more with my eyes half or fully open these days. I'm just checking back with motivation. Why? Why are we doing what we're doing? And here we can find some hidden motivations and we can also find conscious motivations. Hidden might be because I want to be a good at meditation. <laughs> or, sorry, like a little slightly unconscious. I want to be good at meditation. Or I want to feel more calm. Or I want to really know the nature of my mind. Or I want to know more about how to cut through attachments. So some of these motivations you can see are, are more skillful than others. So see if you can start to orient towards the more skillful ones. And then just reflecting on, again, briefly bodhicitta, this aspiration to become awake for the benefit of others. And we already started to describe awake. Awake is connected to this limpidity of the window, unobscured by attachment, aversion, clinging, the obscuration of perceiving an independent self, an independent other. And so we can aim towards that. Just recognizing, cultivating or strengthening this capacity of remaining aware in this present moment is one of the foundational practices, is some of the work we need to do to then look at the experience in order to have insight, space into how attachment is functioning, how to feel attachment as it arises, how to experience it in the mind, how to, so to speak, catch it before we act on it. So I like, I think, not sure if you put together the write up Dundrup, but I really like this expression, the energy of attachment. Because it can be a felt presence in the body. It can be a thought. It can be just like a vague in between. It's not quite a thought. It's an energy. It's some kind of movement towards something. So how do we catch this more in the beginning? Through awareness. Really awareness is the beginning, middle and end of Buddhist meditation. In my opinion, there's really nothing more. It just deepens into insight, into experience of non-duality, and then into awareness without any reference point. But we have to start with a reference point, most of us. So just find your reference point, whether that's the breath, whether that's sound, something you're looking at, or visualizing the Buddha, visualizing a Buddhist deity, also a shamatha object. We're just going to yoke our attention to that object for the next, let's say, 15 minutes. And as we start to pay attention, we leave room for this quality of the mind that can be aware. So the attention is not the awareness. The awareness is the observing, this quality of watchfulness. There's an element of watchfulness that's aware 
we're paying attention to the breath or whatever, and it's aware of this moment. It's aware of this move, moment moving to the next moment, to the next, to the next. So see if you can allow the mind to be aware, open and aware, without judgment. And using your object as an anchor, something that you can come back to when you notice the mind is distracted. It's something we use to train with. And automatically, maybe some of you sound like meditators for a while, but I'll just say this just in case. We're not good or bad for becoming distracted. Distraction is actually natural and normal to meditation. But when we remain distracted, when one thought leads to another and another, and suddenly we're not aware, then we can't say we're cultivating awareness. We've lost awareness. And that's not, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing like good or bad about us in relation to that. It just means we need to come back to the practice of awareness. And so what do we do? We remember awareness. As soon as you recognize and you remember, ah, meditation, my anchor of meditation, there's awareness, tension, present moment awareness. That's it. So just be happy with that. We can kind of simplify the shamatha process sometimes. Sometimes it's like too much juggling when we read it from a book. Oh, there needs to be introspection and this and that. No, 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 no. This will just give you wound problems. <laughs> Unless you're like already a very chilled person. So I'll leave some silence now. We can just strengthen this muscle of awareness together.
So in our last uh, five minutes of practice, I just want to invite you into a practice of meditative awareness without support, uh, without an anchor. So if you're are you used to this, you can start to shift your practice in that direction. If you're not, I'll just guide it a little bit. And so one helpful tip here is just to, again, re-recognize or reconnect to that part of the mind that's watchful. That's this element of watchfulness of the whole experience, both the object or anchor of meditation, sounds, sights, smells, other sense perceptions, thoughts. And this watchfulness has no judgment either way. It just simply knows, experiences, and is aware. See if you can start to center that more in the meditation. So the object that's in the forefront, like the breath or something you're visualizing or sound or whatever you took as your anchor, let that move from the forefront to the background and let the awareness start to just move into the forefront. And so usually we have a shift here where we kind of freak out and wonder, well, what, do I, what should I be aware of? And my answer is everything. Just let experience flow. We're not practicing insight, so you're not looking into the nature of that experience. You're just resting in nowness with the awareness. And rest is a key word here. Rest is a term that comes a little bit more in, in what's called Mahamudra Shamatha. So you kind of lean back into awareness, but you don't lose the vividness of the meditation. There's vividness, an element of clarity, and just nowness. You're just aware of that. My recommendation, we have only about three more minutes of practice, is just do this in short chunks. You just click into awareness. When it fades or you lose it, just click in again. Just do that in like 30 second, 45 second, one minute intervals. Don't try to hold it or squeeze it. Just let it happen. No big deal if it gets lost. You just remember Okay, and then as soon as you remember, you're aware again. All sound, sight, smell, taste, touch can flow through that awareness. There's a sense of nowness. And increasingly non-distraction. We'll, we'll tempt this for the next few minutes here. Okay, so as we 
we begin to let go of the formal, the structure of formal meditation, I like to start by just looking around the room a little bit and see if you can integrate awareness into movement now. So what that means is as we move the body, as you look around the room, try to let a, this light touch, this light experience of awareness just continue to resonate like as if you're ringing a bell and the sound is just continuing. And if you lose it, it's okay. No big deal. Just try your best to see what happens. If you can carry that into the next moment. There was a bell of some sort. <laughs> I think it was a horn, car horn. Okay. Thanks everyone. You can you can wake up now. <laughs> or whatever you need to shift. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Awesome. Thank you all. Um how did how did the practice go today? It was that good, huh? Speechless, unfindable, luminous mind, speechless, nothing to see, nothing to catch. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Unanchored was very, very, very difficult. That's the first time I tried that. Cool. Yeah, it, it can be real challenging if you've never tried it before. But the good news is, just like anything, you can get used to it. Thanks for trying it, by the way. Some people just don't even bother, you know, because like, oh, I, really, I just want my normal meditation. I want to just close the door, not feel anything. And, you know, like, so I'm, I'm good for you for, for just doing it, you know. Anyone else? Lana, don't drop. <laughs> it was very hard to turn it up, turn it, turn it off. You know, your your mind keep grasping for for concentration on something. Like it kept going around and trying to fix it. Okay, it's not a breath, and maybe sound, you know, maybe something else. It kept kept kind of wandering around and just scanning for for something to, to, to anchor itself. You're talking about without the support, yeah? Yeah, without, the, like when I stopped concentrating on the breath, I felt it immediately started to look for as an object and sound came up like first, because obviously we are not in total silence. So it started focusing on sound instead. Cool, good, good, good. All good, all good stuff happening, by the way, right? Because this is kind of a process of, you know, for those of you who aren't used to that kind of practice. And what I'd like to do is actually address both of your experiences, but I'll do it a little bit later. Maybe when we come back from the break. Anything, don't drip. If, if not, it's okay. You don't. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Good, good, good. So, like I said, maybe we'll come, let's come back to that. Cause I want to talk a little bit more about working with attachment just before we go break for lunch, but let's come back to that. Cause I'll talk more about open awareness, shamatha on, on the, on the other end. And um, just for some context um, briefly on that, um, I, I prefer to work with um, uh, generally when I teach, you're going to hear more Mahamudra, Mahamudra shamatha teachings. So that comes out of, uh, you know, if you just want something to know where that comes from, that comes from Mahamudra Shamatha. And so in the in the Galuk tradition, the primary text we work with on that is called the ear, the, the, there's different names for it, but basically the ear, whis, ear, whis, ear whispered Mahamudra tradition, Galuk Mahamudra tradition. And it's by the the first Panchen Lama, uh, Panchen Lama uh, Chok, 
Choki Gyaltsen, yeah. So the, um, this text is, is really wonderful. It's very short. It's very pithy. There's a commentary from Lama Yeshe on it from the FPMT. That's very, very beautiful. And so typically Mahamudra has a little bit more of a, a different process because we take mind as the object when we're working through shamatha and insight practice. But I'll go into that later if you all want to know more about that because this isn't really a workshop on that. But the reason I thought to bring that in when we're working with attachment is really awareness is the main thing we need to strengthen. And sometimes in shamatha, what happens when we're not centering awareness, what gets strengthened is sort of a single pointedness. And this has a this has an effect on attachment because when we're single pointed, attachment reduces. Actually, all the kleshas slightly reduce, but they kind of more numb. They don't go away, right? They kind of just like for a second, there's there's just so much focus on something else. They, they, they get dimmed, I guess is a way to put it. And, and that's useful. But, so I just want to name that, that, that first one, just single-pointed shamatha type practice is useful because it, 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 it sort of dims the attachment. And then we have more room, right? In that moment to look at it or whatever, and more room in insight practice. But what sometimes can be the challenge is then we don't know how to work with the attachment when it's not dimmed. And this is where general open awareness can really help. So to just, um, rather than centering single pointedness, we center awareness, right? So that's why I'm talking the way I'm talking and teaching the way I'm teaching, just for some context. And awareness, like I was saying, is really, when we're talking about catching the energy of attachment or working with the energy of attachment, Awareness is our, our, our main friend. It's, you know, it's our main skill we need to develop. And I would say the thread through any Buddhist meditation is going to be awareness, right? Because awareness is that capacity of the mind that, that knows, but it also has this ability to be watchful or observant of an experience. And so primarily, awareness really takes on its most powerful characteristics in Vipassana or insight meditation, because that's when we're looking directly at the nature of attachment, the nature of self, you know, like Lana was pointing out earlier, like, you know, we were talking about this tree, the branches or the root. Vipassana really aims for the root. Eventually, it really aims to cut the root of, of where attachment is coming from, which is a misperception of reality. But nonetheless, um, awareness as a thread, even when we're talking on the shamatha level, really, really helps. Because when we take the mind as, you know, the object, um, it's like the, it's not the official object, but it's the unofficial object in shamatha without support. We also get more skilled at watching the movement of thought. So watching the movement of thought and watching uh, when there's stillness. So primarily we're working with that in, in, in Mahamudra shamatha. So it's this awareness, uh, whether we call it, certain tradition or a certain practice it's this awareness that helps us as it strengthens to sense attachment or sense aversion for that matter and eventually it gets more subtle into sensing how we're fixating or clinging to any kind of subject object experience which would be the the the, the main primary like working with the root right so but just wanted to center that as we go into some like methods and, and different ways of catching it. And so I, I kind of separated awareness into a few categories for you that I thought might be helpful. Um, so as I just said, the main one is just strengthening where awareness in general, any kind of shamatha we can do to do that. Um, I will tell you my, my view on this a, a little bit more. I said something, but I'll say it a little further. I'm not sure if single-pointed concentration strengthens the awareness. And, and what I mean by that is there can be two or three different kinds of awareness. There's normal awareness, which is basically when we are um, paying attention to a task or paying attention to something, and we're not, there's, no, there's no sort of remembrance of that. There's no quality of awareness in that, right? So sometimes what people call meditation actually and this usually happens outside the Buddhist realm, but, but it can happen to people who practice Buddhism too. Um, sometimes what people call meditation is being in a flow state or simply paying attention to something like, oh, I'm doing the dishes and I'm very focused. And that's meditation. 
And from a Buddhist perspective, generally, we wouldn't call that meditative awareness. Um, it can be called meditative awareness in other traditions, and I don't want to knock it as something bad. I think that's something very useful. But the, the problem from this perspective, from, from a Buddhist wisdom perspective, it doesn't cultivate the awareness. So there has to be awareness, actually. There has to be a quality of the mind that's, that's knowing what's happening. That's how another way I'm defining awareness. Awareness is kind of a double knowing. It's like we're knowing we're knowing. Right? When some of you tried to pay attention to the breath just now and then be aware you're paying attention to the breath, it's like you're knowing the breath because you're attentive and you're knowing you're knowing the breath, right? Did you notice that a little bit? Good. <laughs> if you didn't, it's okay. That is what awareness is, right? So, so, and it's a little, in language, it's a little, I think, cumbersome to talk about it, but in experience, it's just right there. You all could relate with it, I think. You all can connect with that part of your mind that can observe, right? And that's not the attention. The attention is another component of mind, a, a useful one, right? We need both in shamatha. But nonetheless, normal awareness is sort of just like being distracted, like every day, just sort of being distracted, lost in thought, lost in whatever. But it also can mean focus without awareness. And this is where the distinction between meditative awareness and in the Mayana Buddhist tradition and just general, you know, what other people might call meditation there. This is where that is, distinction is made. So when I say strengthening awareness, it's really the second type, which now we can say is meditative awareness, which is cultivating nowness, the attention of nowness um, via awareness. So there's an aware paying it, you know, there's an aware who knows that's happening. So that's how we would qualify meditative awareness or shamatha practice. So, um, so strengthening that is going to be one of our biggest, you know, and, and this is accessible to us right now, I guess is, is why I'm really, you know, harping on this. This is accessible to us because all of us have some kind of meditation practice. We're here today. And so now we might be able to refine that into like, emphasizing the awareness a little more or something like that, or getting to know the awareness, that, that's a process. But nonetheless, we can strengthen what we have. We can strengthen that awareness. And that awareness is a natural gift of the mind. It's not something like you need to produce. It's there already. We just need to strengthen it. And so once, it, once we've strengthened it to a certain degree, or maybe a degree you already have in your practice, um, then we can, we can watch or be watchful of different kinds of experiences of how the energy of attachment arises in, in, in our human experience. So I kind of named three, and then maybe we can, we can also come up with more if you have some together. So basically, I came up with um, we, can, we can be aware of sensations in the body, physical sensations. Like we can bear witness to those. We can be aware of thoughts, right? And then we can be aware of what's arising in the body that's not quite a physical sensation, but it's not quite a thought. And, and this would include emotions, but it, it would also include like what would I like how Tundra, if you wrote the you wrote the thing, right? You wrote the yeah, cool. <laughs> Thank you. It's really good. Uh, what Dundra wrote, the energy of attachment, right? And, and energy is sort of this thing that's like I was saying, what is that? I mean, maybe we can even talk about that. But these are kind of these three things I came up with and, um, you know, how to apply awareness, awareness towards sensations, awareness towards thoughts, awareness towards energies as they arise in the body. Um, what do you all think? Would you add anything to that list or? I notice in my personal experience, there is also, especially when I meditate, there is an energy that's there before the thought. Yes. Uh, yeah. There is an energy. I, there is an energy that something kind of building up, trying to break through, and then this thought comes. I can totally relate to that. Yeah, yeah. Anything on your you you know don't drop blue um uh like what what we could add? I guess emotions we could add is the sensations, thoughts, emotions, energies arising, uh, or. You know, Lana, it sounded like, what would you call that? Like, it sounded like that's like a, almost like a pre-thought a pre -thought or like a... Pre-thought, yeah. Yeah. It's a movement of the mind before the thought comes. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would even say it's a movement of energy, which is the movement of mind at its subtle level, but we don't talk about that in Sutriana. That's more of a tantric perspective, but nonetheless, we can throw it out there. (laughs) Don't you blue anything on your minds around this? Kind of like a restlessness maybe to what Lana's saying, like, like, is sort of just not being contented with the present moment. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. Hard emptiness craving to be filled. Sure, yeah. And that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a big form of an attachment. I, I call, I often call that hollowness, you know, which is a difficult one to explain because it's not quite an emotion but it's a, it's a physical feeling often. Like, like if you think of heartbreak, it can be a form of hollowness, right? Anything on that, Lou, uh, more? Or... No? no, not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Dundrup, I like what you were, what you were saying about this restlessness. Um, it brought to mind this, um, uh, you know, we have these definitions of the three types of suffering. You all know the three types of suffering, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, all pervasive suffering. And uh, this is one of my favorite analytical or reflective meditations on the nature of samsara, you know, because it brings it so deep, you know, where suffering of suffering is like, you know, we all know things suck in the world, we get sick, etc. But when you, we start to think about the suffering and change, that's when we start to que- question what happiness is. And when we start to think about pervasive suffering, that's when we start to think about like more underlying unconscious things that are ruling us, that entangle us in samsara, or I guess how we're entangled in samsara. But Dundrup, you, you, what you were saying brought to mind this, um, I've heard a definition, I, don't, I believe it's not like the FPMT definition, so I'll just say that, um, a definition of pervasive compounding suffering or all pervasive suffering as restlessness. I've heard a definition of it. Uh, actually, it was Minga Rinpoche, uh, a, a Kagyu Lama who, who defined it like that. And I really like that because it's like, like, like I think it's, it's almost the feeling of restlessness you're talking about is something conscious. You know, we feel it. But it's almost like a, he was talking about a restlessness that's unconscious where we're, we're, we're shifting to the next thing or we're looking towards the next thing. And it's sort of how attachment drives us at a pervasive you know, a level and how that's, that, that's sort of a, a very root, co- root, not a root cause, but a root suffering. What do you think, Dundrum? <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's more of like a, something I'm, I'm reflecting on because that restlessness is a, is a, is a huge one. I pretty much noticed that's my experience a majority of the time. And then there's maybe some time when I'm not restless, when I'm in the meditative experience or coming out of that, or maybe I'm having a better day of mindfulness and awareness, you know, but when I'm not, when I'm obsessed with, you know, writing or some other activity, I come out, you know, I come out into this restlessness. I don't know for you all, but for me, that also gets like imputed onto all kinds of different objects. It becomes like, like one object seems like seem seems like it's the thing I need to wrestle with within that restlessness, but actually it doesn't really matter. The restlessness can be applied to anything in my day. It's just sort of like whether it's like making lunch or writing an email, or it, it just sort of moves. But there's the misperception that it's the email or the cooking. You see what I'm saying? Then you have that experience that you can recognize. Could it be like? The space between when attachment realizes that what I'm, what I'm doing right now is not satisfying me. And then that space between when it realizes that and it actually finds the other thing to fill that space, there's going to be that little space between one attachment and the next attachment where it's, it's going to be searching and it just trusts us. It knows it needs to find something else. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I experienced that for sure. You experienced that, Lou? Is it part of, you, part of your experience? Yeah. Yeah, yes. and, and that's where like restlessness, dissatisfaction, they're kind of related here. 
some people like to translate dukkha as dissatisfaction, you know, the, the Sanskrit word for, for suffering. I like that, you know, you know, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so I wanted to also kind of like just talk about a list of methods for working with the, the arising of, of this attachment energy. Oh, you know, I never defined attachment. I think we've kind of spoke a lot on it and actually you all have a lot of clarity and different perspectives on how to describe what attachment is and just, just really good ones. Um, I just kind of came up with a definition, um, which we could play with too. It's not mine, but <laughs> uh, so attachment, we could just define in one sentence as a state of mind that exaggerates the pleasing qualities of a pleasurable object, right? So Dundra pretty much put that in, in the write-up for today, but, um, but we can kind of pull that out. A state of mind, or we could say an experience, uh, a state of being that exaggerates the pleasing qualities of a pleasurable object, right? That's one definition for the mind of attachment. So, so when we're talking about the methods for working with attachment, um, we talked about awareness as kind of the main one. And I would say without awareness, it's not really possible to do any of the other kinds of methods, right? That has to come first. There has to be some ability to know um, on whatever level. And then um, when it comes to working with this, this definition of, you know, the mind that exaggerates something that's pleasurable and exaggerates the qualities of it, right? Um, one of the first things we find in, in, in Buddhism is really a, a reflection on impermanence. Um, that's really just number one. You find, you know, Buddhism 101, you find that. You find impermanence as a method to work with clinging and attachment. And like I said, you know, in the beginning of today, uh, you know, really 80, a lot of the Dharma is just working with clinging. I mean, it's working with aversion too, but aversion is actually a little bit easier. So this is some premise. This is in my experience, I'm not sure for you all, I'm kind of, so maybe I'll ask it as a question. Is aversion easier to work with than attachment for you? You know, what's your experience of that? Maybe we can talk about that for a second. For me personally, I think when I started to work on my soil, the first thing that was gone is anger. It is an aversion. And it was very easy because I think we subconsciously know what's bad. So the bad qualities are easier to let go, right? So first it was anger, then it was kind of frustration, irritation, like all these things. I felt it was easier to work with. When you have attachment, you know, you attach to perceived, obviously, happy feelings, right? So the good things are kind of harder to let go of. Yeah. Totally. It, it's harder to convince yourself, you know, that, you know, anger is uncomfortable feeling. So it's easy to kind of say, okay, I don't need that. You know, I don't need this energy. You know. But, you know, joy and happiness that you think something that you attach to can give you those are harder to 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 kind of let go of yeah yeah something pleasurable yeah 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 that's my experience too awesome Lana. For me, exactly what okay. i was gonna say but go ahead yeah <laughs> that's okay i didn't want to interrupt you <laughs> no no please uh, for me aversion was like Lana said, easier because you could see aversion hurting other people. And it's really easy for me to key on that. But somehow attachment seems like the only person I'm hurting is myself. And that's a little bit harder. Get that excited about it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That, that's a great perspective. I mean, I, I think sometimes like attachment can harm others indirectly. Right? Like I notice with my, myself and my partner, if I'm really attached to something I'm doing, I may be neglecting something she needs, right? Or, or not seeing what she needs. So there can be an indirect, you know. But yeah, I totally agree with you. Aver aversion and anger, definitely like that's where our most harm comes for others, right? For sure. Anything else? Uh, did you have anything to add or? 
Um, perfect. Yeah. So, so Lana, just honing in on what you said too, that's pretty much the main thing I wanted to get across, which was around this area of um, it just being easier because anger just doesn't feel good for most of us. You know, it just doesn't feel good. It, it we feel tension in the body. It, it actually has bad medical side effects. Like just as someone who doesn't give a crap at all about, a, you know, Buddhism or awakening or enlightenment or even being kind to others, you know, we could easily prove to them, Hey, you should work with your anger issues because you're getting hypertension and heart problems. You know what I mean? Like, like you could prove to someone that way. So yeah, it has this immediate benefit and attachment is just so slippery. You no, know? it's so slippery. I mean, that's the main thing I wanted to come in with today is sort of it hides. It's like a trickster where it looks like, hey, you know, this is the thing you want. You go into that thing and you realize, damn it, I was fooled again. You know, it's like that again and again and again. Very challenging. Cool. So going back to impermanence a little bit, um, we can, if you want, I can talk about some some practices on impermanence. Maybe we can do that when we get back if you if you want that. But generally, this is just reflecting on the nature of change. So with an object of attachment, this would be reflecting on how that object of attachment changes, right? How it doesn't stay the same. How, you know, um, I really like to reflect, I mean, I, I, the problem in a workshop on, on, on attachment is now you guys are gonna know all of my addictions and what I'm attached to by the end of today. So, you know, you, you probably can tell already I have a strong attachment to delicious food. So, I mean, I think, you know, that's not like a, that that unique of, a, of an attachment um but nonetheless um you know when i reflect on the nature of change in relation to my attachment to food um there's there's some process of reflection all the way through there's sort of like okay the beginning was like you know i'm hungry so there's a biological thing coming in then there's then there's the smell there's the look there's the you know the initial taste and then as i watch the change of my experience of the food, each taste is less and less exciting. You know, each bite is less and less exciting. And, you know, this is kind of like, I really like, I'm just going to be so vocal about this today. You know, I read about this, like in long rim commentaries and stuff, you know, when I first started studying Buddhism and um, some t- that it was great because it gave me some information to work with. But it really didn't matter until I started to watch my own experience through awareness. You know, it didn't help me that much. It helped me to know there's a way. So there's some value in that. But until I started to put it into practice and like, it's really hard to watch an addiction or a habit or, you know, it was hard initially to be like, oh, I'm going to watch myself eat this pizza or watch the experience of the pizza and the taste and how the taste changes and how I get full and I don't. I'm less excited about it. Like, that's not something, you know, going back to what you said, Lana, it's like, it's not that, there's not that much incentive to do that because it destroys our pleasure. You know, like, that's the thought. It's going to destroy my pleasure, right? Um, So I just wanted to name that. Um, I find that really interesting where, for me, there's sometimes a reluctance or resistance at first to, oh, like, like working with this. There has to be some impetus. You know, um, uh, Lou, you brought up renunciation. You know, there has to be some renunciation mind, understanding attachment is not my friend to first be able to be like, okay, I'm going to look at this, right? Um, oh, it's almost lunch. So let me get through this list and then we can come back to this at the end. So impermanence, uh, that's one prime method. Um, a second one related to impermanence is reflecting on the fuller nature of, of our object of attachment. Another way to talk about this is, is strengthening our discernment via looking at the nature, just the relative nature. We're not talking about the ultimate empty nature, just how is this object, right? And again, this is very challenging with something we like, you know, like when I want to go binge Netflix, you know, it's like, I don't really feel like questioning the nature of Netflix or the show I'm going to watch or whatever. But when I do, definitely the attachment reduces, right? Or question the nature of, you know, a cupcake or whatever it is. But when we do it, this is really one of the main tools uh, initially within Shravakyana path or, or lower medium scopes of Lam Rim. This is one of the main tools we have for, for 
coming down to earth, basically, for coming down to a more realistic perspective of our object of attachment. So if we can get ourselves to the point of asking the question, is this as it appears? Does this object exist as it appears to me? Then we can start to do an inquiry into its nature. In uh, monastic training, you have, uh, you know, lots of practices for monks and nuns where you, you know, uh, basically imagine the disgusting parts of the, uh, you know, whatever sex you're attracted to, imagining the disgusting parts of the body and things like that, breaking the body into parts. Um, you know, monks would, would also go to charnel grounds for that reason, you know, and watch bodies burn to see sort of the, the, not only the change, the nature of change, but also the, the sort of unpleasing aspects of it. And this was all the counter uh, sexual desire or sexual attachment or right? attachment related to desiring the body of another or pleasure through the body of another. And that, you know, that nuns and monks were both invited, are both invited to do that with whatever sex they're attracted to. Um, so this is kind of like one very intense way to do it. And um, honestly, like for, for me personally, and I'm just, I'm inserting a lot of myself in here, but I do that on purpose because I don't want to get so theoretical and abstract. Um, that was a tough one for me. And that was tough for a lot of reasons. And I think the main reason was it was a resistance to that, like a resistance to breaking down or destroying my, my fantasy of something, you know? And so that's why I'm kind of going back a step and really emphasizing, we have to work with that resistance first. And that's where developing some clarity around getting free. When I say renunciation mind, for me, this has very little to do with what we do with our physical behavior, though it does have to do with that, right? To be clear. But renunciation mind can very much get co-opted into sort of what am I doing in the world? What am I getting away from? But that's really just a, a preliminary. That's like a, a beginner's practice, so to speak, where the renunciation mind really has to come in the mind where we see that something is blocking us from freedom or to put it uh, in some language from earlier, so, you know, whatever, however we're relating to the object or thing or experience in our life or state of mind, it's entangling us more in samsara. So I found that when renunciation mind is developed on that basis, it has a much more powerful effect. And, res you know, the resistance I was talking about, about questioning our objects of pleasure, trying to get more discernment with them, this also starts to give way when the renunciation mind grows in that direction because we see, oh, I just want to be free. I want to know the nature of mind. I want to know how phenomena exist. I want to know how self exists. I want to liberate myself from all of this tension and entanglement and constriction. So when that's happening, I think then there's, there's, there's the ability to cut, cut through the resistance because we've, we've sort of centered what we actually want to do. Right. But not to belittle it, um, life changes are meaningful. I mean, I remember when I first became a monk, people thought, oh, you did this big thing that's like so hard to do. I'm like, dude, this is like, this is like absolutely necessary for me right now to get some distance from my objects of attachment, you know? And so there's this kind of sense like being monk, a monk taking monastic vows as a fruition. I've always thought about it as like a start. You know what I mean? And, and I know not all of us can do that, but we can do that as a lay practitioner as well in our own way. So the, the physical distancing, the life, the physical life changes, those are necessary, but they're really just laying the ground for the greater renunciation mind to, to grow off of that. So I just want to point that out. The only reason I point that out is because sometimes that we can beat ourselves up, you know, and, and, and get, get pretty confused or like, um, you know, take pride in, in having, I take a lot of pride in like a simple life. Like I still live, I live probably more simple now than I did as a monk. You know, I have very little stuff. And sometimes I take pride in that and I realize, oh, I'm sort of like misplacing my renunciation there. When that actually, I have a lot of attachment to the one backpack I travel with, you know? So it totally defeats the purpose of, <laughs> you know, of renunciation. So anyways, I won't say more about this, but you know, directing, what does renunciation mind really mean? And so then when we're working with resistance to taking apart objects of pleasure, 
then it helps because we're, we have some hope. We have some, something we're looking forward to. So just before a break, I'll just read off the rest and then we can go into it more later. So strengthening, strengthening our discernment. Really, discernment is the main wisdom, the wisdom of discernment that we cultivate as an antidote to clinging and attachment. Um, inquiry was another one. We've been kind of talking about that the whole time, so I don't think I need to talk about that more. I've been trying to weave that into the whole session so far. Um, shamatha, we talked about that already. Shamatha is a training of awareness. Vipassana, we have, or insight meditation, we haven't talked about that yet, uh, but that's just again, like another level of, of awareness meditation. And then compassion or, or maha karuna, great compassion. Um, this can be a wonderful tool for working with attachment. And, and so I, I'll center that when we come back. And then, of course, um, kind of what we were just talking about, these physical decisions and changes we can make and set up that are foundations for working with attachment. And so I would put vows into that category as well. As well. So taking vows as a lay person, we, we take, you know, the five lay precepts generally uh, when we take refuge vows and that forms the Prati Moksha vows. And then for monastic, you know, they have the different levels of monastic uh, uh, vows and ordination. And so, but nonetheless, we shouldn't discount them. You know, whether we're a monastic or lay practitioner, they're really, really important um, because like I said, renunciation mind ultimately happens in the mind, but our body really matters. What we do with our phys- actions of body and speech influence so much and so much mindfulness, so much awareness gets cultivated when we take vows uh, because we choose, I'm not going to do, you know, I'm going to put a boundary here. And then we have to be aware of that boundary all the time. Right. And, you know, some of the ones like not killing are maybe more obvious and, you know, like, we don't have to be as centered around those. Though, though I think when it comes to killing smaller life forms like bugs, you know, there's a lot of mindfulness to cultivate in that, you know, because often we're stepping all over the place and killing things inadvertently, right? Uh, but nonetheless, um, things around the 10 non-virtues, which is just for every Buddhist practitioner, like working with the mind of covet, covetousness, working with the mind of um, ill will, these are things that require a lot of mindfulness, right? And so when we're working with vows and ethics, um, it's, a, it's a huge training in working with attachment. So I just want to point that out as well. So anyways, we'll, we'll take a lunch break right now um, for an hour and a half. Is that, is that what we're yeah. doing? Yeah. Cool. So, so over the break, if you want to practice more, I encourage that if you have time, if you want to, kind of like reflect on anything we said, you know, that was spoken on or, or talked about today so far and, and bring it to the session when we come back. That's great. And that includes like things you may have a slight different view on or disagree with. Like that's always welcome because it, it opens discussion on this topic. Right. So I just want to name that. So <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I was going to say one thirty mountain time, uh, twelve thirty Pacific time. Perfect. Thanks everyone so much. Thank you.